I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the what we call the benzene cases or Industrial Union Department of the AFL-CIO versus the American Petroleum Institute. This is a famous US Supreme Court case from 1980. Again, sometimes you'll see this referred to as the benzene cases. It's about benzene in the workplace. And <clears throat> it's about delegations to agencies. And especially when we the agency has to make a scientific determination, and then the courts have to evaluate uh, that determination. So let's move on and see what happens in this case. Section 6B5 of the Occupational Safety Act instructs the Secretary of Labor to adopt standards to assure to the extent feasible on the basis of the best available evidence that no employee will suffer material impairment of health of functional capacity, even if such employee has regular exposure to the hazard dealt with by such standard for the period of his working life. In other words, we have to make regulations for ongoing exposure at the workplace, not something that <clears throat> happens uh, in a one-shot incident under this particular statute. And for my students, I just want to say, um, we have, a, this is a confusing case, right? Because it's um, partly a non-delegation case, but it also brings up a really difficult issue in regulatory law or administrative law about agencies having to make safety regulations when in the midst of some scientific uncertainty, when we don't know all the answers, right? So sometimes we know it's a, a certain amount of something is lethal, but we actually don't know what a level of it is safe and or safe enough um, for ongoing exposure. And that presents some problems for the courts when an agency basically has to pick some standard and they have to draw a line somewhat arbitrarily. So OSHA overall regulated benzene um, this is a gas based on its apparent carcinogenic properties. In the 1970s, a number of studies came out that uh, showed that linked benzene to exposure to leukemia specifically. And so OSHA invoked its authority under 6B5 to require employers to limit their workers' benzene exposure to one part per million of the air in the, er in the workplace. It had been 10 parts per million until then. So if you imagine like some sort of little detector, benzene detector, sort of like a smoke detector, or some of you um, have seen carbon monoxide detectors in homes and buildings, the, um, this, a workplace, especially refineries that have a lot of benzene in the air are going to have to have a detector to make sure that it doesn't get above this certain threshold. And it had been 10, and now we're making it a tenth of that. That's a pretty drastic reduction. And so the agency promulgated a rule that regulated benzene to the maximum extent that was technologically feasible. And but they had hoped it would not jeopardize the financial viability of the relevant firms or the economy as a whole. And so the agency, though, had no real basis for adopting any specific safe threshold. So they just adopted the minimum detectable amount at the time or reasonably detectable amount of one parts per million. And keep in mind, who are the parties in this case? Well, it's the, uh, the a subdivision of the union, the labor union that was advocating or litigating for safer working conditions versus the trade association for petroleum refiners. And this was going to be money out of the pocket for the refineries because they would have to install super duper HVAC or filtration systems, like in their heating and air conditioning systems or uh, something like that to um, reduce the amount of benzene that was in the air that their workers are breathing uh, day to day. So the question then, and this is a recurring question in administrative law, is what if no one can determine with any certainty what is a, the safe level but we know that higher levels are lethal, right? So it like causes cancer. So we know there's no amount of benzene that we think is good for you. The question is how much exposure is too much or 
at what point is the exposure de minimis and we don't think that you will suffer adverse physical harm, even though it's not good for you to breathe it, um, we think your body can handle it, can fight it off or whatever um, medical term you wanna use. So the agency couldn't really articulate a reason, let's say that one part per million was better than maybe two parts per million or five parts per million. They were concerned that 10 wasn't safe enough, but they couldn't really show why they were drawing the line where they did. And they couldn't, um, and of course, higher levels would have been more feasible and therefore more affordable for the industry. So the regulated industry, the oil companies argued that there's a phrase in, in 6B5, to the extent feasible, and that they think requires that the benefits of the regulation roughly match the costs. And they, in other words, the agency should have had to do a cost benefit analysis and and calibrate their rule <clears throat> so that the, um, uh, uh, that the cost of the implementation is justified in terms of how many statistical lives would be saved. So this, we have this interpretation question and part of what's going on in this case is a statutory interpretation question that's honestly a little bit unsolvable. <laughs> And so what do we mean by the extent feasible in 6B5 of the OSHA Act? And there's th really three possible answers. Do we mean technically feasible, te technologically feasible, like it, it, that you, you can uh, get equipment if you're willing to, if money is no object that will eliminate benzene? Or do we mean economically feasible, like it, it's a kind of affordable, or are we gonna do a cost benefit analysis and say that there's some kind of uh, mix and match or assess the trade-offs and set the level so that um, we know that there's a cost, but the cost is, it, all of those costs are justified in terms of how many lives are saved, but we're not going to make you set a stricter rule um, if, that, if the additional strictness isn't going to save any additional lives. And that's part of the argument of the industry here, as opposed to the workers, is <clears throat> that, um, so let's imagine hypothetically that um, if we lower it from 10 parts per million to four parts per million, that now no one is going to die, right? We've eliminated the fatalities. Well, so then the additional increments or units of reduction we have to do, they would say are a waste. Sure, it's better to have no benzene than any benzene, but if we're not going to save additional lives with our additional pollution controls or, or, or safety controls, then, um, then we're spending that money for no reason. That's the argument. So we have a, a split opinion here, a plurality instead of a true majority. And they held that the toxic substance standards in 6B5 had to be read in light of the general definition of occupational health and safety standards found in another section of the statute, section 3.8, which defines this as one that is reasonably necessary or appropriate to provide safe or healthful employment and places um, of employment. And if you think that that clarifies everything for you, then I guess I need you to explain this to me. The plurality concluded that any OSHA standard had to be predicated on a <clears throat> threshold finding of significant risk reasoning and that safe does not necessarily mean risk-free. And so the, just to, as a side note here, they're basically saying this is unclear. And what they want the agency to, to do is make an antecedent regulation, a preliminary regulation that says how they're going to pick standards in these difficult cases. Like how, how they, we want to see the agency define some terms and delineate what they're, how they're going to make to these difficult decisions in the future so that when we have a specific toxin come up like we have here, we're not just pulling a number out of thin air, right? So uh, no pun intended. All right, let's go back to the case. The plurality added that this interpretation is necessary to avoid a serious constitutional question under the non-delegation doctrine because they're saying without a threshold requirement of significant risk, OSHA would have authority to regulate the entire economy subject only to uh, the constraint on feasibility, which the plurality concluded would raise a serious non-delegation question. 
And uh, so there's a couple of big things going on here. First of all, remember that uh, here we are at, in the um, late 20th century, and it's been decades since the Supreme Court has invalidated any statute on non-delegation grounds. And a lot of law professors were, had decided that non-delegation didn't matter anymore because every the court hadn't seen a statute since the 1930s that they didn't like and uh, from a non-delegation standpoint. And all of a sudden, kind of out of the blue, here we are with the Supreme Court, or at least a plurality of the court, saying they're actually worried about this statute maybe violates the non-delegation doctrine. And then they do something weird. They tell the agency, go fix the problem, right? We wouldn't have a, de a delegation problem if you would kind of tell us how you're going to confine your decision process. And this is a precursor, uh, and along with some other cases, to the Whitman versus American trucking. Um, it seems like the Supreme Court has, in the Whitman case, has rejected this idea that the agency can kind of self-cure its statute, that it's sort of like Ulysses binding himself to the mast of his ship or something like that, when the statute is too vague that the agency could solve the problem by setting parameters that they're going to work within and that that would satisfy the court's concerns. But that is what the court asked them to do in this case. Okay, let's go back. Now, uh, Justice Rehnquist wrote a concurrence in this case that's actually um, one of the most famous parts of the case because he says we should actually just invalidate the statute on non-delegation grounds. And so this was the sort of shot ac across the bow of Rehnquist saying, I wanna bring back the non-delegation doctrine and start invalidating statutes with it. And people were like, the what, what doctrine? Um, and so he thought that this was never going to work and that there was uh, the type of constraints that the court was asked, the, the plurality was telling the agency to, uh, to undertake or basically asking an agency that had been given too much discretion, they're now giving them additional discretion to solve their problem with having too much discretion. And again, that doesn't make any sense. And he says, let's just invalidate the statute and make Congress fix it, basically. Now we have a full-blown dissenting opinion here by the left wing of the court or the liberal wing of the court at the time, Justice Marshall, Brennan, White, and Blackman. And they think that the OSHA didn't do anything wrong here and the statute's fine and the rule is fine. Um, they say it did not run afoul of the non-delegation doctrine, that it's just as clear as lots of other statutes that the um, court has upheld in the intervening decades. And they say that the interpretations of the plurality contradicted the plain language of the statute. They think the statute actually tells the, the agency what to do and that the agency was doing just what they were supposed to under their statute. So here's a postscript about this case. The case illustrates kind of two styles or approaches to enforcing the non-delegation doctrine. The plurality strained to construe the act narrowly in order to avoid a serious question under non-delegation doctrine grounds. But the dissenters would have just deferred to the agency. They actually, so in other words, the plurality here is still concerned about how much latitude or unfettered discretion the agency has. And so they're construing the statute in a way that's narrow and is going to make the agency start from scratch on this rule then the dissenters are really not that worried about non-delegation uh, things. Um, they're not throwing the doctrine out entirely, but it, it, they're pretty clear that they view it as a weak doctrine and they would have just deferred to the agency's um, interpretation. And also from a statutory interpretation standpoint, please know, um, because this is an interesting uh, kind of clash of the canons of construction, the dissent invokes a traditional maxim that the specific should govern the general. Like if you have a specific phrase in the statute and a general phrase, you should interpret the general one in light of the specific. And the plurality sort of does the opposite. They interpret a specific clause considering the general um, framework and the other general statements in the statute. And so um, you, it's, it's not clear which one is right, right? This is a matter of opinion, but we have these different canons of construction and here they're 
pointing in different directions. Here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. What was the problem with OSHA's regulatory action in the benzene cases? A, the agency did not articulate a basis for setting the standard at a certain level versus other possible levels of safety. And B, the agency did not provide due process to the members of the American Petroleum Institute in their hearing. Now, hopefully you know the answer to that. If you don't, this was supposed to be easy. You should rewatch this video. Now that concludes our lecture about the benzene cases. Um, as sort of a, 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 a PS to my students, a postscript, keep in mind that we have ongoing questions with safety agencies, health and safety agencies like the FDA and OSHA and the EPA that regulates pollution um, about what to do when science actually doesn't give us all the answers we want, right? So science gives us part of the picture. We know that something is dangerous, but we really don't know at what point we're safe. And the agency is supposed to draw some lines and, and make some rules and, and they can't argue for why they pick the number that they did with science, right? They have to pick a number. And we know that if we don't pick a number, people are going to die, let's say. And we know that we could set a standard that will save lives. But what science doesn't give us enough evidence about or facts about is where that line should be. And this is an ongoing problem in our regulatory state. Okay, that concludes our lecture.